and we're live. Hello everyone, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and welcome to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues episode number 55. In just a few minutes, in about five minutes from now, everything, uh, if the, as I say, technology uh, gods are with us, Burton Richardson will be on with us and we will uh, we'll get to rocking and rolling. Hey, Pierre, uh, David's here. Says, uh, actually, Pierre, Bert was first, but that's okay. <laughs> Mark Stewart is here. Uh, Andrew's here. Bert, keep an eye out for, um, for the invitation because it says that you're watching, but you got to, I, I don't know where the invitation comes from, but I did send it to you. So um, let me fix this for a second here. All right. All right, Calvin Eng is here. Brian Tomani. Hey, Carla. Mark Rendon's here. Andrew Muir. All right. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Well, we we logged on early, so we'll have, uh, well, if if we need to, we'll have a couple of attempts before uh, everything gets uh, connected. But um, yeah, Bert, like I said, look around somewhere. There's an invitation for you to uh, to join me on camera. All right. So while we're uh, while we're waiting for that, let me tell you guys what's going on in the in the world of uh, Jeet Kune Do dialogues and what have you. So um, this is Mr. Richardson's. Um, this is his second time on with us. We're going to be talking about um, his recent attendance at um, Taki Kimura's ninety fifth birthday celebration, and then also talk about his um, participation in the, the simultaneous uh, Junfan uh, Gung Fu Instructors Conference. Um, next Friday, if, well, no, I don't have anybody confirmed. There, I mean, there, there are two people that, that I'm hoping will confirm. So I won't tell you, I won't say anything about next Friday, but the following Friday, hopefully he'll be on here in just a second. And uh, he's gotten my message and he will confirm also. So Joseph Harrison's here. Hey, Angie. Tiffany Brooks is here. Paul Factura. All right. William Bernas. All right, cool. Patrick Hughes. Hey, Glenn. Um, hey, Sonny. Anthony Fontana is here. Randy's here. Eddie Scott. Hey, Arnold. Sifu Randy, Steve Corley is here, Peter Miller is here. Um, all right, so some of you guys are old timers, so you know how it happens. Sometimes we have to shut down and reboot and boost stuff all over again, and then um, then it works. But uh, just give us a second here. Um, yeah, so, um, so here, so I'll tell you, Hey, Kevin Porter. So I'll tell you what I'm hoping to pull off in April. In April, I'm hoping to do another uh, JKD Femme Fatale series, which means then that we will have, um, we'll, we'll have uh, ladies of Jeet Kune Do. And as I say that, look at who shows up, Beverly Pratka, right? So, so uh, Beverly confirmed with me for, for April. Hey, David Hatch. Um, and... Uh, Sean Sutton is going to get back to me. I'm pretty sure he'll be on the, um, Hey Clay. Um, yeah, somehow Bert's, um, Hey Chris Jenkins, Bert's invitation isn't, um, isn't showing up. So guys, we might have to, uh, shut down and reboot. Hey, Steve Mosley. Um, I hate when this happens, but, uh, Hey Spencer. Okay, give it a sec. Nope, nothing yet. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. All right. So Bert's saying that he's having he's having trouble being being seen. So um, everybody, stay right where you are. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, shut this down, reboot it, and um, hopefully then it'll, it'll make the necessary connection. All right. Okay, guys, stand by. All right. Take number two. haven't had these kind of issues in a long time so um nope all right guys hang on one second let me just uh let me say hey adam let me send bert a message here and make sure <laughs> that's true ron <laughs> ron kosakowski says it's not just him that has trouble um, all right. Ah, there we go. Ah, Bill saying he, okay. I, I think the connection's working now, so I, I will, he'll, he'll see the, the, um, the comments and we'll relay it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, my phone works on my phone, not so much. All right, so you hear that that, that feedback? Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Can you get the, the can you get your um your uh, earbuds? Sure thing. Hold yeah. on a moment. Let me get the rest of it. Okay, I'm reading your palm print. You have a yes. long life. You have a long life ahead. Is that, that looking good? <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Can I get some other yes. device? So this? everybody can see you're quite well prepared. Oh, totally. Yeah. I was. <laughs> Here we go. There's my palm print. All right. Cool. Hurry up, Sean Sutton's on. Sean Sutton is here and he's impatient, you know. Okay. Here. Try that again. Here. Um, you... Not so here. good. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, with the earbuds, it's. Okay. Not so good. No. We'll have to do it without the earbuds. Okay. All right. Well, it's just not working. So yeah. I was going to do it on my on my desktop. Oh no, that doesn't work. It does, doesn't work at all, does it? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go someplace better. It Almost doesn't work. There. Not at all. Okay. Oh, say hello. hello. Oh, boy. Hey, TQ. How you doing? The messy kitchen and everything. It's a busy morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Let's just go outside. How's that? Okay. Okay. All right. It's a, just so y'all know, beautiful day in Hawaii. But what, what's going to happen when I turn okay. on the car? All right. So, how's that? All right. Oh. So, so, first things first. I have to pick a bone with you. Please. Pick away. Yeah. Okay. So you, you invited your many Facebook followers to ask questions if possible. Were you thinking that I know you so well that I might run out of questions for you? <laughs> Are you crazy? You know, I'm just, I just throw stuff out there and see No, what no, happens. no. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me explain this to you. Let me put, let me explain this to you. I am one of your biggest fans. I will never... I will never run out of questions to ask you, all right? 
Good God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So um, here's the thing. How did the Seattle gig come about? So actually how it came about is, I um, uh, guess, Andrew, uh, Andrew Kimura uh, decided they were going to put together a big instructor conference. And I don't know exactly mm -hmm. whose idea it was at first. And then Matt Emery uh, took the rein and really went hard on uh, promoting it and getting the idea out to everybody. And I happened to see it on Facebook. And I thought, hey, mm -hmm. what a great idea. So I contacted him and said, hey, uh, I'd like information on attending. I was just going to go to the conference as a student and learn. Yeah. And then they asked me if I would like to teach. And I said, well, gosh, if you want me to. And then I, I said I had I could be there Monday and Tuesday. They had the um, uh, tour set for Wednesday. And then there's the Thursday training. And I had to leave mm -hmm. Wednesday because I had commitments back here in Hawaii. But so right. I taught two and a half hours on uh, Monday and on Tuesday. And it was it was phenomenal. It was really, really I mean, phenomenal. Yeah. The, the, I mean, just the pictures alone look f uh, f phenomenal. Now, had you, you'd met Taki Kimura before that? Yes, I had. Okay. Yeah, I figured many, as much. Many, many years before. And then yeah. uh, I, uh, at one point, see, this is, this is one of the things that I found so amazing about Taki Kimura from way back. It was the late 80s. And Andy Kimura, Siku Andy, had come down to L.A. And he was at the Inasano Academy because, you know, always mm -hmm. with an open mind. And, you know, it's just interesting in JKD, we know we're supposed to have a very open mind as far as, hey, let's explore things. Let's see what works for us and what actually works on, under combat situations. That's what we do. But right. we know yeah. practicality wise in what actually happens is a lot of times people get very comfortable in their thing and they don't look outside or they start to think that their thing's the best and all. But uh, like Sifu Andy is a great example of not being like that, always being open and looking. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So he comes down to LA. He's at the Insano Academy and he came up to me one night after asking, talking to, to Guru Dan. And he said, you know, um, my father, would, is very interested in Filipino martial arts footwork. He's very interested to see some of the ins and outs. And uh, we're wondering if we, if you wouldn't mind, can we maybe video, can I videotape some to show my dad, right? And I'm like, I'm blown away. Right. You know, I'm just some <laughs> guy at the academy, some instructor guy at the academy. And and Siho Taki Kimura uh, wanted to put me on video so he could study some Filipino martial arts footwork. I mean, that is just the epitome yeah. of what JKD is supposed to be. That is phenomenal. About. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. great? So there you That's... go. So, man. And then another in interesting thing, a few years ago, there was this documentary on Filipino martial arts called The Bladed Hand. And uh, yeah. if you, any of you want to look that up, it's very interesting. So some of the guys were out in Hawaii, the producers, and so they shot a little section of me, uh, you know, with a, the bladed hand and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in the documentary. So uh, they were showing it. They were screening it in Seattle. And my student, Jarlo Ilano, went to the, to the screening. And he's sitting there waiting for it to start. And I get a phone call. I'm in Hawaii. He goes, hey, mm -hmm. I'm at the screening. Guess who's sitting right behind me? And I said, oh, who? He goes, Sifutaki Kimura is right behind me. I'm like, really? <laughs> he goes, yeah. I said, could you say hello for me? And he goes, what? And, he, <laughs> and, stand up. and so anyway, he ends up, you know, turning and very respectfully, respectfully saying hello. He says he has me on the phone and Sifutaki takes the phone and we have a nice conversation. And I thought it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, awesome, right? Uh, I thought it was interesting there because uh, what he was saying, his main things was, you know, after he said, oh, how are you? I hope everything's going well for you and this and that. He was just really mm -hmm. emphasizing. He said, you know, let, let's help everybody get along in JKD. Let's help everybody be, you know, more unified yeah. and help. And, you know, that's what he's all about. And like you're, look yeah. at your podcast you're doing here. This is amazing. I mean, you are really helping 
people from all kinds of different views in JKD to get together and tell their views because nobody has, right. you know, the whole truth and the, the way right. this just doesn't happen. But uh, we just thought that was interesting of all things. He would emphasize uh, the main thing is like, just try to get everybody working together, working together instead of all these yeah. uh, factions. So, right. Yeah. How, how did, um, how did you decide what you were, what you were going to teach? Well, that took a little while to think about, actually, because I said, well, this is a Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute instructor conference. So it's JKD, right. but it's, you know, we're not talking my expression of JKD. Right. We're talking Jun Fan Gung Fu. Uh, my wife's about to leave, and so we're going to get a little car noise here. But um, uh, so I thought about it, and I thought, you know what, what I really want to emphasize, because, you know, people see me, I think, on you know, showing stuff and all out, they often see jujitsu and they see kickboxing and stick fighting and this and that. And, you know, which is all part of the JKD right. limited. Uh, but what I think they don't understand so much sometimes is that it, the basis of the whole thing is JKD, John Fon, JKD mm -hmm. philosophy. That's the basis of mm -hmm. everything I'm doing because it's all about street functional, you know, how can we take something right. and make it street functional? But for this, I'm not going to go show JKD right. Unlimited because that's not what it's about. Um, so we, I decided, well, I'm going to have two sections. And I thought the first one, the most important thing is the philosophy because that's where personally I see that it, it gets away from that functional thing. I mean, if, I mean, what would you say, Dwight? If, if you were to, would you agree that one of the core basic tenets of jkd is functional fighting like under a street in under street situation for sure that's it right i mean that that's most definitely yeah most definitely that's one of the the distinguishing uh features of jeet Kune Do is about being functional being able to actually do it in a street situation okay now right. um with that said what we, what I decided to do is uh, because, you know, we, it, I've done it. Uh, and in my opinion, there are a lot of people are doing it where they're doing, quote, JKD as far as techniques go. But the quality of being able to actually apply it has been, has mm -hmm. gone by the wayside for a lot of people. Not everybody, of course, not everybody at all. But that's what mm -hmm. I see is, is a lot. And so I thought, okay, the first section I'm going to talk about uh, philosophy, uh, training methods. We'll do technique and look at details on technique to make a big difference. Okay, so that's what we did. So right. started it out. And first of yeah. all, let me say what a phenomenal group of people we had there. We had people from all over the world. We had people that traveled. Yeah. It looked like very, fun. It really you know, looked like fun. Man, it yeah. was so much fun. So many people. And there was not a single person in that seminar that, you know, you thought, oh, gosh, oh, this person's, you know, just isn't along, is, doesn't have the spirit, the right spirit or, or it's just, you know, just oh, that person really, this is the wrong seminar for that person. And they, everybody there was yeah. on board. They were training hard and they were really, really grasping it. Uh, I'm not talking about just me, just when whoever was teaching and just, man, mm -hmm. what great energy. I mean, it was really, it was really mm -hmm. encouraging just to see how the quality of the human beings we had uh, at this conference. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. so as the conference started, if, if you want me to go through that, uh, the first session was Sifu Andy. So Sifu Andy went up there and, you know, what a pleasure to watch him uh, teach, explain. I mean, he just, he's been doing it his entire life and it was just, he, he's so smooth and it was just brilliant. Okay. So mm -hmm. then it was my time to go. And this is what I did. So uh, I'll just recap this because I think for me personally, this is my personal thing is this is what I want to instill back in the JKD world. And I think if we do this, that's how we get back to more prominence. Um, so I'll explain right. what I did and then I'm going to talk about see Chris Kent a little bit as well. Uh, so what I did is 
we started talking about training methods. That's the first thing. Let's talk about training methods. So I asked, give me some training methods. And so we, little by little, many, many different types of training methods. So if anybody out there right now thinking about, thinking about, okay, training methods, you have what? What's a training method? Hitting the pads. That was the first one that came up. Pad work. Yes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's training on equipment, hitting the focus mitts, hitting the kicking shield, heavy bag, even a mukjong, or, you know, all these different things. These, this is training on, it's pad work, basically. Now, focus mitts better because the person's moving and alive, they can throw stuff back at you. All right. And then we kept right. going. And there were things like conditioning and sensitivity drills. And we talked about chi sao and a little bit, you know, and these sort of things. Right? Great. All right. But it took, I videotaped it. It took over two minutes to get to sparring before anybody said sparring. And, you know, that is the primary for functional, effective training. It is the primary um, training method in Jeet Kune Do is sparring. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, so what I did is I took out some, some quotes from Bruce Lee. Uh, I took out the old quote, uh, you know, if you want to learn to swim, you have to get in the water. If you want right. to learn to fight, you want to learn Jeet Kune Do, you have to spar. Right. And that's just the way it is. And yeah. there's another very interesting quote uh, that just recently one of my students, David Giomi, he was the first guy I ever made Jun Fan Gung Fu, uh, J Jun Fan JKD instructor. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, to this date, he's the only one. Uh, but I'm going to change that because we, we need to push and let, get, let more people see this amazing art. Uh, but he sent me, he had taken a photo uh, in the Bruce Lee one put put together by John Little of Bruce Lee's notes that uh, was uh, commentaries on Jeet Kune Do or on the Marshall way. Mm -hmm. And it, it says that he is, that he was basically, he was training. You know, we, we often think of Jeet Kune Do being really created with that Wong Jackman fight when he had the, the challenge match and he fought. It didn't go quite the way he wanted to at first. It took too long. They end up just chasing the guy down. And, you know, he went outside right. the style, chased him down and all that. Okay. And then he found his conditioning wasn't as good as he wanted and this and that. Okay. That's usually right. when we think of Jeet Kune Do. Well, according to this quote, he said he actually, uh, he said once he's in 1966, once he started training, putting with equipment as, as the gear, yes. in other words, right? Yes. Putting yeah. on the helmets. Yes. putting on the chest protectors yes. and going, as he said, going all out. Because that's when mm -hmm. I realized I had a lot of prejudices before and they were wrong. Mm -hmm. That, and he goes, that is when I changed the name of the gist of what I do to Jeet Kune Do. So he, right. according to Bruce Lee, he changed the name to Jeet Kune Do when after getting a lot of uh, experience sparring, you know, Full if, contact if sparring, right, yeah. Full contact, because guess what? You go full contact, as you know, oh, things are different, right? We we actually feel things very differently because um, as the other person's really hitting back at you, and you have that fear factor, right. and it hurts, and the whole thing. Okay, so we talked about that. Now, of course, everybody's going at the seminar. I'm sure they're, most of them are like, wait, are we about to go full contact? Are we going to go all out? <laughs> <laughs> There are there are a lot. Of, I, you know, I have a reputation for sparring and all that, and and right. uh, there's this, they're the dog brothers, and they're like, oh god, what are we gonna do now? But uh, uh, I just made the point that uh, because in a bunch of the quotes it said all out sparring. I mm -hmm. had a quote from Dan mm -hmm. Lee talking about how oh you have to do all out sparring. It's the only way. It's the only way. Right. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of yeah. truth in that. But we need to build it up little by little. So what I did is I had everybody right. said, okay, now we're going to spar. I said, but we're not going to kill each other. Because here was the poor, whole point of the whole thing is sparring is absolutely essential to JKD. Absolutely essential. When uh, Sifu Chris Kent did his section, which was, I mean, it was amazing. It, it was, yeah. I said it. Afterwards, I mean, it was a master class in Jeet Kune Do. It was so beautiful. Yes. He hit so many points and just so concise. But he got to talking about the sparring and his sparring days and uh, about thinking he had a detached retina and all that sort of stuff. 
But see, back then, <laughs> yeah, great. You remember when you went to the academy, uh, the Kali Academy back, um, when was the first time you went back there? Do you know? Do you remember? I was there in 83. 83, right. So do you remember yeah. back at that time, there was this aura in the place. There was this feeling. And I didn't really think about it until this weekend, uh, the other, that last week when we had the conference, when Sipu Chris was talking. But there was this aura, like you were there to learn how to fight. You know, you were not there to mm -hmm. learn an art. You were not there to learn how to look good. And this, and you were there to learn how to fight. You know, someone's going to come and try to knock you out and you are going to learn how to knock them out, basically. That was the feeling. It was a fight club, a fight gym. Yeah. Right. Well, right. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah. But what happened is, and I, I related this in the, uh, the conference is I was in class and they started new, a new class every once in a while. So they gave me a call and said, Hey, the new class is starting. You put your name down. You can come down next week, whatever. Okay. So we start and there are like 30 people in class. There might've been 40, but I'm going to just say 30 to be on the safe side. Okay. Brand new people. Two months in, Rich, see for Richard, because Rich, see for Richard would teach one night, see for uh, Dan would teach the other night. And uh, see for Richard said, okay, bring your boxing gloves next week, next week, Tuesday, or whatever it was, and bring your boxing gloves. We're going to start sparring. Okay, great. So we all bring our boxing gloves, which were just the worst horrible boxing gloves, you know. Um, <laughs> and it was just, okay, spar. That was pretty much it. We started sparring. And, right. uh, you know, it was, it wasn't sparring, it was fighting, right? Yeah. We, there's, yeah. there's a bunch of fighting happening. Uh, so the next class, there were about eight people, right? Went from 30 to eight as soon as the sparring was introduced. So that is why, and this is totally valid, that is why the sparring has gone to the side in JKD, or at least in the, for people who want to have a lot of students, it went to the side. Right. But, yeah. My whole point is this, is we ha used to have that all or nothing approach, and I had it too. It's like either you're drilling or you're sparring, which was the same as fighting. But sparring's not fighting. Sparring should be sparring. It's a learning process, mm -hmm. and it should be safe. It can be uncomfortable sometimes just because the ego and all that, but it should start out mm -hmm. very comfortable and light. And we work it up, and over time, people can go a little harder, a little harder, and we add more safety thing so what i always start and what we did at the at the seminar is we just start open hand try to touch your partner on the top of the head lightly so your partner knows if you get touched you know you get feedback that's the thing in sparring you get punched and you get feedback right. your, your body starts to adjust to it this is another way to get feedback but just nobody gets hurt and it was beautiful because you know everybody everybody was sparring moving around and laughing having a great time and I just felt like they really feeling what that's what Jeet Kune Do is it's about learning techniques okay but but then how do I apply them how I have to go in and make those mistakes in order to apply them but we can do it in a in a safe manner to make sure we mm -hmm. we can go so that was a long answer that was my first session uh was the philosophy training methods and details on techniques. Then the, the second one, which I thought I'd bring up because it's pertinent, it was how to deal with an MMA fighter using JKD. And that's very pertinent right. because nowadays, you know, a lot of guys that yeah. cause problems. That's what everybody sees on TV. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting. Uh, growing up in America, uh, and sure, same for you growing up where you grew up, uh, there's this boxing culture that permeates everything. Even if we don't train boxing, it's just we're used to the boxing culture. If two guys go at it, what do they do? They have no training whatsoever. And they go like this, and they're throwing punches, and they're like this. Well, I just thought that was human nature, right? But I saw a, mm -hmm. a video of a fight in Indonesia one time where they didn't have the boxing culture. And it was like this, right? It, had nothing, it looked right. nothing like boxing. It's just, it really made me understand like, oh, hey, guess what? Our boxing, being saturated with boxing since growing up, seeing it our whole life, it just, we, okay, that's what fighting looks like. Well, now it's MMA. Right. Uh, you know, I have a police officer 
friends, a guy that was the head trainer for uh, Honolulu Police Department for decades. And he said, nowadays, guys aren't just running away or like throwing a punch and running away, the bad guys from the police. They're actually squaring up, faking, shooting mm -hmm. for takedowns, trying to shoot a show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to be able to deal with that in this right. day. So, so we worked on that as well, how to deal with it. And I just pointed out that, hey, nowadays in MMA, top level MMA, there's a lot of Jeet Kune Do. There's stop kicks. Yes. There are some of the covers they're using, some of the fainting, some of the footwork. And if you talk to, you, know, you talk to top MMA coaches, almost all of them have been heavily influenced by JKD if they haven't actually been trained and certified in it. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. everybody, same with the fighters. So, uh, so that, that, those were my two sessions and it seemed I got good feedback. Uh, maybe some of you guys are out there. I hope you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been trying to, I've been trying to, um, keep track of some of the comments and Bill Sang was, was there. And I yes, think, uh, Joseph Harrison was there also. And he sure they, was. yeah, he they confirmed. The yeah. They confirmed they had um, they had a, a great time. So you talked a little bit about what you've taught there. Generally speaking, can you give us some of your some of the guiding principles that you use in in structuring what you teach and how you teach it? Yes. Okay, that's a great question, man. Good one. Uh, my <laughs> no, that is a great great question. When I'm teaching, my main structure is. I start with a, a an assumption, this is, and it's very deliberate. My assumption mm -hmm. is somebody in that seminar someday is going to be attacked for real, mm -hmm. and I am preparing them for that fight. So I'm not – my mindset isn't, hey, let me go entertain them, right? Uh, but I'm going to try to make it entertaining and fun. Yeah. Uh, my mindset isn't, hey, let me uh, teach them, you know, 50 things that they can write down and maybe what my number one guiding principle is I'm training them to go into combat for real. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big distinction I got from all my MMA training and coaching in MMA. Yeah. You know, when we're training somebody for an MMA fight, I mean, they're going to face someone who is highly skilled, who is a professional athlete, because we're talking about UFC, professional athlete. Lots of experience that's going to try to punch, knock them out with a punch, knock them out with an elbow, knock them out with a knee, knock them out with a kick. Going to try to take them down and ground and pound them or submit them and all this. I mean, we are mm -hmm. training all the time. 100% of the time, it is training to deal with a real attack. There's no, hey, right. let's do some of this right now. This is really cool. Hey, look at this thing. This is fun. No, it's, no it has to already be vetted. There's right. a lot of that out there, you know. There is, right? There's a lot of that out there. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this, because two yep. things came out of when, when you said that. Do you have, is there a Jeet Kune Do message that you've been trying to convey for a while that people still don't seem to get? Uh, I'd say the main message that I'm trying to get people to, to know is go see Dwight Woods. <laughs> right? That's my... That's message number one, but it seems to be working now. It's, it's getting out there. No. 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 No, well, it must be getting there because look who just showed up. Suyoshi so Abe just showed up. Yoshi. Hey, yeah. Yoshi. Nice Isn't to that see you, Yoshi. Oh, my God. Yeah, Yoshi's awesome. And, you know, Yoshi's so nice. He, uh, besides being, you know, one of Guru Dan's assistants for years or decades and, uh, you know, has done so much. He's done so much in the stunt world. You know what Siyoshi did for me? There is a photo that we all took. It was uh, Brandon Lee, Siyoshi, myself. Um, who was it uh, on Renegade? Um, uh, gosh, the star for Renegade. Anyway, it was on this TV series. And mm -hmm. there was a photo taken. And Siyoshi had it. And he actually went and dug through all his stuff. And one day and found it and got it to me, which is, you know, he didn't yeah. have to do that. That was a lot of extra work. But anyway, yeah. so Yoshi's yeah. awesome. So um, I'd say the main message that I'm trying to get out there is to include the sparring and take the focus of your Jeet Kune Do training toward application. 
Right. You know, it's not, that's it. That's the whole thing toward application. And see, one of the questions, actually, is Joseph Harrison brought up this question at the, at the conference. He said, you know, what do we need to do to bring Jeet Kune Do back into greater prominence? Mm-hmm. And I really believe that right now, a lot of times people go to a Jeet Kune Do class or they see a Jeet Kune Do class. They have this filter now of, in, they're not looking at it through movie stuff. They're looking at it through the eyes of, of MMA because they've yeah. seen so much MMA. It's like, that's what fighting looks like. Now yeah. we know should be adding groin kicks. You should have the eye jabs. You should be doing a lot of, you know, you're not going to just kind of move around and you're going to be overwhelming on the ground. You're going to be trying to stand up, all these sort of things. Okay. But um, they're looking at it through MMA. And if they come in and the first thing they see is very complex, like trapping procedures, for example, not that they can't, they are not of benefit and not that the trapping can't work. I showed functional trapping, I showed trapping that I use on it on UFC fighters, like guys mm-hmm. that in the UFC and we spar, right? And we can use this trapping on them. Okay, but uh, people come in and they look, and it just doesn't look anything like fighting to them. And so, uh, and I think maybe people have the idea too that they get in and it's like, oh, that's yeah, I don't know, that's not quite what I was looking for or whatever. So I I just think that if we make sure we have the sparring, but we do it safely and progressively. Mm-hmm. So anybody can do it. Like well, last, okay. Well, yeah. So give give us give us then an example of progressively a progressive approach to sparring. Great. Okay. This is what we did at the conference, and I'll give you an example from last night in class. Yeah. Last night we had a woman show up the first time. She's never trained martial arts in her life, except she did do a little boxer size at at one time, long time ago. So she's in her early thirties. Uh, we bring her in. I first thing we do is I say, okay, here's the first thing we're going to do to, to move, to warm up. Just keep your hands up and kind of throw a jab and a cross. I show how to throw a jab and a cross while everybody else is shadow boxing. We do that for about a minute, two minutes. Okay. Then I say, okay, get a partner. She gets with a partner. I said, okay, you're going to take your lead hand and try to touch the top of your partner's head. Your mm-hmm. partner's going to try to touch the top of your head. You block like this, you move your head, whatever, go. She's sparring. She's been there two and a half minutes since she is already sparring, but not scared. She's right. laughing. And it's a game. But is that not knife sparring from the old days? It's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. It's the same exactly exact thing. When we used to go just open hand with touch, you touch inside the leg, touch at the arm. Yeah. It's exact, exactly the same you want, thing. You want to hear something funny? What's I that? used to do that as the warm up for my fitness kickboxing classes with women. See, there you go, yeah. right? And how much fun did they have? Yeah, yeah. It is so much fun to play tag with a partner. But see, what happens is instead of learning a lot of technique or drills and this and that, right. and even focus mitts, you know, people are punching their hands are down here and all. And then you put them in sparring one day and it's a fight, right? A bunch of them are going to get banged up, right? Yeah. And they're going to go away. And it's, But when you start like this, by the time we progress to putting on a helmet with a face cage, mm-hmm. so nobody's mm-hmm. getting black eyes and all, right? We put that on. By the time we get there, their structure is already there. They already know how to spar. They've yeah. just been doing it with open hands. So uh, Sifu Chris Kent brought up very important point that early on uh, at the Kali Academy and in Guru Dan's uh, backyard when he was training before they even opened it up, right. that they sparred every single class. Yes. And or I think almost every single class. Anyway, they sparred a lot, uh, but there was a lot of isolation, just like we we're just doing there. It was jab only, only the lead hand, only mm-hmm. lead hand. And then it was lead hand, lead leg. Said even at the Chinatown, Bruce Lee's Chinatown school, there was a lot of that lead hand, lead leg sparring because that's what the emphasis was. Yeah. Lead leg stop kick to keep the distance and slow them down. You know, you're trying to go that longest tool to the nearest target idea and so it was a huge emphasis on lead hand lead leg sparring Mm -hmm. well you can do the same thing like we did last night with the the woman Mm -hmm. is that she was in there sparring right away and she has a big smile on her face and she's moving around and it's exciting she's actually relating to the person yeah uh which is on the other side 
you know, actual fighting is what, you know, you relate to what's happening. You can't right. do it, go, oh, he's going to come in. I'm going to go A, B, C, D, E, F. No, because they're not going to be there. You have to relate to what's happening, feel mm -hmm. what they're doing and find how to fit in with it and find that those openings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if you don't do any of that for three years, then it's a whole different mindset. You've been so conscious about your whole uh, training. It's been in here. It's been you the whole time. I put my hand like this and I, I keep my shoulder up and I my chin down, all these sort of things. When if you start with the sparring right away, immediately you're working on the relating and relating to somebody else and dealing I with see. that yeah. input. So yeah. uh, that would be, that is my number one thing that I think is going to really help everybody, help everybody okay. with JKD. And yeah. you know what? It's so much fun. Yeah. It's so much fun. And it makes you humble because guess what? Nobody doesn't get hit. Everybody yeah. is going to get hit. And that's just the way it is. You know? So how, how, how do you teach him? How do you teach him to deal with the emotionality of something like that? And because the, the reason why that comes up is because um, I'm reading uh, Bay Logan's 700 page book, Bruce Lee and I. And so I'm on the chapter um, inside Enter the Dragon, right? Huh. So he's, he's, he's given background on the making of Enter the Dragon. And so I just read the part about, um, you know, it's Lao's time. And then, and then the famous phrase, we need emotional content. Mm -hmm. So, so how, do you, how do you impart emotional, as a Jeet Kune Do instructor, how do you impart that concept of emotional content and then how do you handle when people lose it because they get hit? Great. So by starting, first of all, as dealing with that emotional thing, if you put them in there with the gloves and the helmets and, or no, you know, like we, we used to do, right, with no yeah, well, head protection whatsoever, right. just boxing gloves. Um, yeah. You know, somebody gets hit and they get scared. They either get scared or, and sometimes that fear turns into anger. Like, why are you right. trying to hurt me? And they, they lash out. Okay. Right. Um, uh, that is a real thing to deal with. If they're scared, that's what I, how I feel. If they're scared. Now, if their ego is so big that they get touched and they lose it, then they shouldn't be in the class. That's how I, I screen people. But, but with that open hand game, nobody is afraid of getting hurt. They're mm -hmm. not, they don't, they're not getting injured. They're not getting a huge hit. They don't feel someone's trying to violate them or injure them or whatever. Uh, and so they get used to that environment. And by the time they put on those, the helmets and the gloves, they're used to it. They're used to the fact that they do get hit sometimes. Right. Then they put the helmet on. It's just a little more jarring. And I've never had a problem with people who started with the open hand and progressed to it. I've never had a problem with it. Yeah. Um, hey, now, we're... Okay, go, finish, finish, sorry. Okay, just emotional content-wise. So there's controlling emotion, emotional content. Personally, I'm sure people out there do it different ways. Uh, personally, I do that on the mitts or on the bag. It's like, okay, you, you know, imagine that situation you're in and now you're going to hit hard and fast and you're going to really give it your all. Imagine you're protecting your family and go, and then, then yeah. they get used to working under that sort of stress. Yeah. Um, were you scared when Eric Naus tried to take your your knee out sparring? Eric t trying to take my knee out? Would he do a thing like that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> was I scared? I think I was so shocked. I think I was scared afterwards. It was so shocking to me. Like, what is going on here? This was really... I remember very vividly the, the thought process. I meet this guy, yeah. and then... I'm tricked into sparring with him or fighting with him. <laughs> he the helmets and, you know, no leg protection and heavy sticks. And he yeah. tries to take my kneecap off. And I remember thinking to myself, what? what did, did he just, did he just do that? <laughs> and, and then, a, you know, 15 seconds later, here it comes again. Whoa, fall on at my kneecap. And I move my leg. And, and I re just remember thinking, what's wrong with this guy? I was just, I, I didn't even have time to be scared. I mean, I would, there was right. definitely fear. There was definitely fear because I never, yeah. I didn't do any like really good faking coming into hit and all because I was afraid of getting just clocked. Yeah. But uh, 
yeah, that's why it was so funny. This thing going through my mind is what is wrong with this person? And then the round ends and he comes up and gives me a big hug. And he goes, oh, man, I was trying to hit your knee. I couldn't get your knee. That was great. It's like, what? Talk about yeah. paradigm shift. Oh, God. That <laughs> uh, hey, <laughs> that's interesting. That you, did you just, okay, so, so, so here's the thing, right? So we can hear the birds in the background. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, so here's what I was saying. We can hear the birds in the background. Yes. Right? You live in paradise. You have lovely family. I do. You have great local students. I do. Man, unbelievable. You have great long-distance students in I your... Your instructorship programs. I do. Amazing. You have a thriving online uh, tutorial and membership program. Mm -hmm. Is there anything missing? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing missing. Man, <laughs> I am so fortunate. Oh, yeah. and I, again, it all goes back to Guru Dan. Yeah. I just so grateful for Guru Dan for his mentoring and taking a young man who was, yeah, I was so, I had such depression problems and I was just, uh, oh, eating problems because I was depressed and all this. I mean, it was really, it was tough, but, yeah. um, you know, I just, his, his kindness yeah. and this thing of, Hey, you can do martial arts. And I just figured if I could do martial arts and just feed myself, and have mm -hmm. a place to live, I would mm -hmm. be, that's it. And I actually, for a long time, I thought that's what it was going to be. Right. Uh, and I was happy. Yeah. So all this extra stuff, man, this is just yeah. amazing. Especially, I, I feel good that I can contribute to a lot of people. There are a lot of the people who have become instructors or in even using doing training groups where they work their way up to instructor. They're out there helping a lot of people do functional martial arts. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, back to that, you know, you're talking about teaching and the, my, my main emphasis is, re, is thinking that I'm training these people to fight for a real, yeah. you know, in a real situation. I'm preparing them for a real situation. And, you know, uh, to this date, I've had three students go against a knife. Actually, when I was in Seattle, I taught a knife defense workshop and Leslie Peterson and uh, her group up there, George and uh, Sylvia and everybody up there, uh, there in Eugene, Oregon, they said two of their students uh, had knife incidents where they used the, the thing. It wasn't, you know, never goes picture perfect, but they were able to get right. to the, the baseball bat grip and keep the person away and they didn't get hurt. Yeah. So that's why I do it. And it wasn't, they didn't all train directly for me. That's the thing is mm -hmm. uh, we had people like NYPD train under uh, Israel Cruz, who's phenomenal jake Eaney instructor oh my gosh he's so good uh in new york city anyway the, that's i just feel very gratified that i can help people on their martial path right their life is better because yeah. of the training to become better people and yeah. you know there are families that are intact because people didn't get killed with a knife that's yeah. something so um, no the question is there's nothing missing <laughs> <laughs> nothing missing yeah i'm Gee whiz, I'm so. But pleased. yeah, I mean, not not to uh, not not to uh, to put a negative spin on it, or it, but it's just so that people that people are. I mean, because people are already inspired by you, mm. right? So in the old days, was there ever a time where you asked yourself, "What do I do next? Where do I go to from here?" Mm, yes. So, you know, there was a time. I'll tell you a time. Uh, I got married. Uh, so Sarah and I got married in LA and then we ended up moving here to Hawaii after, uh, not even a year later, we were here set up in Hawaii and, you know, I, I made a, what seems, you know, could be a sacrifice. It was a financial sacrifice because in LA, very easy to go out and do seminars. Now, right. if you're going from Hawaii, like, you know, like imagine yeah. if I were going to come to see you for a seminar 
the, the airfare is maybe four fifty or something from LA. Well, now it's like eight hundred, nine hundred dollars, and I have and I bring my family with me. So right. uh, there's Sarah's stick, and then I, we pay for TQ, and then okay. So all of a sudden, this is a big undertaking, not to mention just the distance involved. And so yeah. I knew that the seminars were going to go down dramatically. I just that's the way it was going to be, mm-hmm. and it did. And so we moved over here. And so at, at, there was a time after we got married because being married and I was like, oh, it's not just me. I don't have to just make sure I have some food and some place to sleep. I actually try to provide a little something for right. my wife. I, I thought of other ways of just making uh, earning more income, you know, mm-hmm. I actually try to, you know, because I'll tell you, it's interesting. I you were, spoke of Sean Sutton earlier, our JKD Unlimited Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, uh, instructor he's awesome and doing great things already created an mma champion and it looks like another was probably on the way here who, and all. Anyway. who will be talking to in a couple of weeks oh yes yeah yes. sean is so thanks for great. that recommendation you're welcome there are others i'm gonna recommend as well like okay. luis barnetto in portugal this guy okay. brilliant jkd mind um so uh you know we were we were talking and i was just talking about finances to him a little while back i said okay for example martial arts world you know i put this book out see lot for the street right what and i asked him what do you think i made you know profit wise off that book it's been out for maybe three years or so now about three three and a half years how much profit do you think i made off that book and i i believe he said his guess he's like oh i'm not good at this you know I said, no, just take a guess. What do you think's in your mind? And he said, I don't know, at $300,000. I said, okay. <laughs> right. right, so you know. Right? <laughs> but, but this is this is normal in the martial arts world, right? And so I told him, I yeah. said, at this point, after paying, I paid for my own airfare. I paid for a lot of stuff to, to do that whole thing. I've made, it's now about $2,000. Yeah. So you put out a book, three and a half years later, you've made profit about $2,000, right? Not exorbitant right. amounts of money that's just yeah. to say that those sort of things in martial arts don't bring you a lot of money but it helps me get my message out and that's really exactly what I do. yeah I mean, yeah i want people to see c lot is functional so a lot mm-hmm. of people say c lot has nothing to offer and, and all um so anyway the point being that i did think about going into a business outside of martial arts just to to have some extra income but then right. my wife says you know don't do that. Just keep doing it. You're not doing good things. at anything else. Correct. That's, that's really what you meant. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything else, buddy. <laughs> oh, right. Back to, back to the gym. <laughs> but, no, this is a fact. Uh, I am not fit for employment, that's for sure. I cannot be employed. I'm right. not employable. Yeah. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was, it was interesting. She's like, no, you know, just we're doing our martial arts. Everything's fine. We're fine. And you know, over time, if you are frugal Mm -hmm. and you are really make sure you put money aside every month, whatever you bring in, you, you know, if you bring in that much money, we'll live on that much and take the rest and put it aside, invest it, whatever over time. Yes. Now that I'm in my late fifties, I can tell you (laughs) that. That time thing, you know, it adds up. It adds up mm-hmm. little by little by mm-hmm. little. But trying to get a big, you know, oh, I'm going to go get that big thing. Ah, it doesn't work very well. But yeah. So. And, and, and people should know, people should know that JKD, uh, JKDUnlimited.com, that's mm-hmm. pretty much Sarah. Oh, that's Sarah. Absolutely. Right. That, Sarah did that. She actually created that website. I mean, uh, everything. Yeah. Everything on there, she created herself. And we had the previous website, the same thing. Yeah. You know, she's gone through iterations. Then she looks at it and she goes, oh, we have to update it. She goes and she learns how to update the site, a new program. Goes, now we're in this thing, Shopify, which is helpful. And she goes it's tremendous. and learns how to. Oh, tremendous. Right. Yeah. She's so smart. Yeah. And what a fighter. Man, what a fighter. This, she is seriously okay. a great fighter. So just so people know, she'll be on next month also. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. right. Um, I highly suggest you talk to Sarah because Sarah did not come from a martial arts background right. and being enamored exactly. in martial arts. She exactly. came from a background where she's like, oh, 
well, this is helpful to learn how to actually fight for real. She, and she has yeah. no tolerance. She has no tolerance for yeah. stuff that's non-fight oriented. So you, it's really interesting you know, to talk to her. You know, sometimes it is better to talk to the women in JKD. You know, it's mm -hmm. really true. There's, and as we, say, as we say, say that, as we say that, look who shows up. Tammy Williams Timlin. There you go. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> you know, I tell Isn't that you, hilarious? Well, uh, okay. You know, a lot of people, uh, I'll say it, they dislike Paula Inosato, okay? Because Paula has a lot of control and she has a lot of rules in place and she enforces them and this and that. A lot of people have a dislike for Paula Inosato. If it weren't for Paula, Rudan would be living in his van. Exactly. Okay? That is just the truth. Exactly. If you don't like her, it's okay. I prefer to have Brudan living in, a, in an actual house, even though they're not wealthy, yeah. which he should be, but he's not. Um, I'd rather have him living in a house than living in his van. Because when I was at the Inesano Academy in Marina del Rey, mm -hmm. it dawned on me one day that, oh, that's why they parked the van inside at night, because Brudan was sleeping in the van yes. in the school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. good for Somebody, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Somebody else just showed up, uh, Ensign Inouye. And I was going to ask you to tell us. Who's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some guy. guy. Some Something. guy who actually, I was going to ask you to tell us stories again about your time with him and his brother. Oh, gosh. We have, do we have seven, eight hours or, <laughs> or what? Man. Ensign. So for those of you in JKD world that are not familiar with Ensign, Ensign uh, and Egan, you know, a brothers, they both came up jujitsu and went into fighting. Uh, they were racquetball champions. I mean, amazing racquetball. Uh, Ensign became a legend in MMA, truly legitimate legend in MMA because of his Yamato Damashi spirit, which Yamato Damashi is the uh, Japanese warrior spirit, like samurai spirit. But the idea being when Ensign went in to fight, mm -hmm. he was prepared to die. He wasn't going in thinking, okay, I'm going to have a fight. And if I lose, I lose, whatever, right. you know. He actually, because at that time, we didn't know. Because MMA was so new. It was actually called No Holds Barred. It wasn't mm -hmm. even MMA yet. It was right. so new. We didn't really know if people were going to be dying left and right in this sport. Yeah. And he would go in against these monsters, these incredible fighters. And he did amazing. I mean, amazing fights. But the spirit that he showed, besides his skill and arm barring Hoyce Alger, one of the greatest wrestlers in American history, arm barring Randy Couture, right? Uh, doing all these things. I mean, he, he was just incredible with yeah. his, his thing. But besides that, what I learned most from Ensign was just this whole, the spirit behind right. of going in and you give it your all. Yes. You go in and you give it all. You do not cower. You just lay it all on the line. And when it's time to go, you go. And, you know, be what may you, your thing is to give it all and not worry about the consequences so much. Yeah. Uh, and I just owe Ensign a huge debt of gratitude because I tell you, when I was having all my surgeries, mm -hmm. and it was really bleak. It was uh, really, really, really difficult afterwards. Like, I mean, I was really in misery uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, the little I could sleep, I'd sleep, you know, 30, 40 minutes and be up again. And it was terrible. But, you know, that Yamato Damashi spirit, everything right. I learned from that hard grind training we did. Uh, it's just like, you know what? You just keep your attitude in the right place and you just there go you forward. Go. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned TQ uh, a few minutes ago. And I've, yeah. seen her, I've seen her on video demonstrating her skills. She could take me for sure. All right? Okay. <laughs> She's surprising, <laughs> right. man. Okay. She's but I've never, seen a, I've never seen a, a picture of you teaching a kid's class. Ah, well, you know, I'll tell you why. Because I teach a kid's class, but it's a, a homeschool class kids class and so we have 18 oh. kids okay it's just that the a lot of times in the homeschool world the, the parents may be a little reticent to have their kids yes. photos right. out there yes and so we yes. have photos but i just don't make them public and maybe okay. i can see if we can actually get one because it's oh it's great and it's amazing what these kids 
can do. Uh, yeah. And, you know, just back on that, you know, we're talking about JKD and we were talking about MMA for a little bit here. MMA really, when you do it right, really brings up your fighting spirit and your never quit attitude because you're going to want to quit. If you're training correctly, mm -hmm. there are times when you want to quit, mm -hmm. but you just keep going. Right. Um, but we do that same sort of thing progressively. Yeah. But with street self-defense in mind. So in other words, we're adding knives and pistols into it and everything, you know, the eye gouges and the groin strikes. So everything's in there as well. Since you mentioned that. Okay. So how is, um, how is CLAT for the streets different from BJJ for the streets, different from MMA for the streets? All right. CLAT for the street is CLAT based. So I'm using techniques I learned through CLAT. Entries I learned through so entries, uh, takedowns, types of striking, and all that sort of thing. But you know the key thing is adding the resistance. And then I say in the program that I do add some elements of wrestling or MMA clinch and all in there because it's so good I can't right. not. So there's a little bit of blending in there as well. But all the takedowns and everything it's it's right from i learned from c lot and from and you'll see them in all kinds of different c lot styles so that's c lot for the street is c lot based uh bjj for the street is is bjj based but uh you know if you went say something happened you went somebody tackled you all of a sudden you're not looking you end up on your back and you immediately put the person in your guard okay say you're in that situation in that moment in time what's the most important dangerous thing the person's going to do to you okay well if you instead of thinking sport bjj which is like oh well the most dangerous thing maybe sits back to a foot lock or maybe he passes my guard and gets to a mount arm bars me um if you go okay let's go mma what's the most dangerous thing well he's going to start grounding pound right ground and pound and mm -hmm. that's dangerous that's not the most dangerous thing in a street situation most dangerous thing street way not the headbutt is that he's going to pull a pistol and shoot you in the face that's what's most pissed what's most important or pull a knife so that has to be now the priority in our defense if we end up with someone in the guard the first thing we do is we control the hands so if they go to draw we can feel it right and that then informs the techniques that are available to us and how we're getting on top like last night we were working on something we went from the bottom we swept we got to the mount position mm -hmm. immediately dismount to knee on the stomach because if i say mount I don't have control of the, of the opponent's hands. My hands are basing out, and, and I, I can't feel if they're pulling a knife and they're going to start s sticking me in the kidney there. As soon as I get them to mount, I dismount to knee mount. I grab the wrists, and now I have control of the hands, and I work from there. So yeah. it's just – it changes the thing. That's BJJ for the street. MMA for the street is everything. It's, so BJJ is mainly ground, some, some takedowns and such. Mm -hmm. On the uh, MMA is just everything. It's the kicking, the punching, the kicking range, clinch range, ground range, weapons involved. It just it covers everything. It's basically J my JKD, right. basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you to reminisce a little bit about time spent with Paul de Tours. Oh yes. Well, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Paul de Tours. Uh, by the way, I didn't get to really tell any stories about Ensign, but uh, uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> funny, another time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we had some good times. <laughs> so, uh, Paul de Tours, uh, man, what a lovely person to be around. Very funny. We'd go on seminars, I'd assist him on the seminars, and very often all over the country i would hear the same thing like man he's like it's like a grandpa he's like mm -hmm. the perfect grandpa and mm -hmm. that's what he was right? yeah okay so you know we uh he'd, he'd do this thing where he'd have this little cap he'd wear and he was bald right he's, he's bald in the middle and he'd take it take it off and he'd say the airport for flies is now open you know and everybody would laugh and he, just, <laughs> he had all kinds but he was very wise I mean, yeah. a very wise man. He uh, had so much wisdom he imparted. And here's one. Um, I asked him one day after I was training with him for many years. I said, I said, what do you want from me? You know, if, if you could choose what I did, I mean, what would you want from me? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and I didn't know what he was going to say. Mm -hmm. But I had a feeling maybe he said, go teach this art or something, right? And you know okay. what he said? He said, be a fighter at heart first. First, be a wow. fighter at heart. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, right? Huh. And so that's really helped inform uh, what, I've, what I've been doing is yeah. being a fighter first. And that's why it's helped so much, like with e Egan and Ensign, is right. it was all about fighting first, right? We were just training to fight as best as we, we possibly can. Okay. Um, so that was a really, really pivotal for me. And he just had, you know, all these sayings and funny things he would do. But, uh, you know, it was just phenomenal. And then I saw a few times this jovial guy with this amazing art, so precise, where I saw a guy one time in a seminar say, well, you know, what if a guy really throws a, a like really throws a jab cross at you, then what would you do? And he just looks at him. He's in his, you know, in his mid sixties. And he's like, well, you know, why don't you show me? And the guy actually, some young guy, punk, went yeah. and threw a jab cross at Paul Dufarge for real, yeah. like, for real. And Paul went Pray! and just swept him so <laughs> fast. It wasn't funny. It was, it was mind blowing. It was, he just, it was effortless that he yeah. deflected these punches and swept this guy. Didn't hit him, nothing. And another time, uh, another seminar, I remember this Wing Chun guy. Uh, and he was in the seminar, but he had a sour look, the whole first part. Oh, yeah, one of those. Session. Yeah, One of those, yeah, you yeah. know what it is. And the guy's, Paul goes over to him and says, uh, oh, you know, you know, are you, you have it or whatever? Because he's kind of like, nah, you know, he goes, well, you know, I would just do this and that. He goes, oh, really? Here, you want to try to, here, do it to me. Show me. He goes, okay. I mean, the guy is going to show him how to counter this thing he's doing. So, Pendecker goes and does what he showed. The guy goes to the counter, like really goes to the counter, right? And Pendecker, of course, just floated with it. And he swept that guy too. Just blam, right? And then he goes, okay, done. time for lunch. Let's go, <laughs> go to lunch, right? So he waited till the end of that session. Right. Because yeah. he knew there was... Yeah. Took him down, called lunch, and the guy didn't come back. Right? Ah, yeah. interesting. Yes. yes. The old so, days. <laughs> the old days, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, you showed, I think it was on Instagram, you, you recently showed like a t shirt from the old days or something? Let's see. Did I? I think so. I think it was, it, yeah, it was back, it was back in the days of, um, was it High Performance Academy? Oh, yes. Correct, correct, right? correct. High performance martial arts. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yes. Back what, in the day. What's something else that you have? What's, what's another piece of um, memorabilia that you have from back in the old days? What comes well, to mind? What comes to mind first is I have uh, a sweatshirt that has the sleeves cut off that Guru Dan gave me. And ah. the one of the old logos, not Kali Academy, but just after the Kali Academy or the late days of the Kali Academy. And okay. I have that. It has four logos and it just, you know, has what, like 20 logos now or something, but it had right. four logos and that, that's really awesome. Uh, a student of mine uh, back East gave me a, a shirt from when I was teaching at USC or actually it's a jacket. A the USC Kali shirt. That's the one. Yes. 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 So, yeah, he busts. I out have those. Game. I have USC Kali and high performance in storage somewhere. I do. Gee whiz. I do. Man, that's yeah. awesome. You know that's what I awesome. have? Insano gave me um, the the polo shirt. I don't know if you if you remember these. There were these cream colored polo shirts, oh, and man. then it had the JKD logo embroidered. And then in a sano under it, I have yeah. one of those. They were probably that's probably the only one left, right? <laughs> yeah. And I also have an in a sano academy sweatshirt, like the four spot one. Yeah, uh -huh. but it says staff also. Oh man, <laughs> awesome! <laughs> awesome! Awesome! Right? Yeah. Oh god, Amazing. we're such old farts, man. I, tell I know you. it's terrible, <laughs> terrible. Yeah, what's going to happen in 10 years? Jeez, <laughs> Listen, so old days, old school stuff again. Remember, we were given the formula of learn the technique, practice the technique, 
functionalize the technique, maintain the technique, dissolve the technique, what have you. Yeah. What is your maintenance program like? Yeah, um, maintenance, you mean like maintaining a technique or maintaining? Well, yeah, so, so technique maintenance, um, yeah. health maintenance, um, uh, uh, mindset maintenance, all that stuff. Okay, yeah. So for me, you know, of course, health comes first, right? That's, yeah. that, that's one of the things the Pendecker Paula Tuarez would always say. He goes, when your health goes, your wealth goes, right? Which is <laughs> like, brilliant, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, so health comes first. So I eat very, very healthy. I have for a long time because when I was younger, I did not. I was, mm -hmm. you remember, I was much bigger. And it wasn't, yeah. I mean, I had more muscle, but it was also a lot of other stuff there. Uh, so I really, um, yeah, I really have a very healthy, healthy diet. Um, when um, I make sure that I do my exercise, I'm, I train with Sarah. Usually, I tr usually train with Sarah four days a week. Mm -hmm. and then I do my own training. Then I have students who I spar with. And uh, we, that keeps me going. And again, our training, like Sarah and I, it's almost all sparring. Like 80, at least 80%. Sometimes, I mean, we'll go for weeks and all we do is spar. Because yeah. that way, talking about maintaining the technique, maintaining the timing, yeah. uh, dissolving the technique because you can't do it exactly the same way because the other person's moving and all. You have to just find where you just don't use it. And, you know, um, you know sparring is the, yeah. the main thing. Um but that, that's what, and also just mentally, I'm always thinking about martial arts and trying to think fast. And uh, I, I do believe, which is not proven, but I believe like when I'm hitting equipment and I, I try to go fast, I'm really working on speed. A lot of it's mental, how fast you think to throw that out there and you think quickly mm -hmm. and you punch quickly. But I, I think the opposite happens too. If you move quickly, it helps your cognitive functions work in a, at a faster rate also ah. so i don't know that's yeah. it's a theory but i'm going with it <laughs> we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah bob Burgi wants to know if you're still vegetarian you know after my surgeries uh i could not gain weight and part of that was because some of the the proteins my vegetarian proteins which were soy based and uh certain things like that i just couldn't ingest them if i mm -hmm. did i had severe uh, issues with the the uh, intestinal, you know, the half of the intestines that were actually left. So yeah. I had to uh, add fish back in. So I, okay. I did add fish back in the diet, and that helped me because I, right now I'm one, I'm under 170, which is still light for me. Jeez, you're um, skinny. I am, right? Yeah. But imagine this: for almost a year, I was 143 pounds. Wow. 143 yeah that is i mean you, there's some video of me sparring at the yeah. boxing gym and i was up to like 152 or something and man i look at him just skin and bones but yeah. um uh yeah so the diet is super important just diet training and you know what else sleep you know we talk yeah. about it but you gotta sleep sleep at night if you can mm -hmm. take a nap sometimes just mm -hmm. you live in hawaii just go down to the beach take a little nap not How much thing. beach – do you guys do a lot of training on the beach? Is that, like, a typical Hawaiian thing? Um, Egan does a lot of that. I'll tell you a story about Egan. Is uh, I would uh, – you know, I'd come over to Hawaii every once in a while before I met Egan. And I'd remember I'd fly in. You'd look down. You'd see Waikiki Beach. And there's this beach park, Ala Moana Beach Park, near uh, Waikiki. Mm -hmm. And it was just oh, so great. You just go down and uh, – spend time on that beach so mm -hmm. i'm coming in the first time i'm going to train with egan i see the beach beautiful egan picks me up it's like 11 o'clock we go back to his place we we train uh we change and we go right to the beach so it's like noon one o'clock we go right to the beach and we start running sand we run Whoa. around and back and down and we do it at the hottest part of the day because it's hardest and we did that day. I mean, that's one of the reasons his uh, Egan's work ethic, why he made it to world champion in yeah. racquetball. Yeah. Without a racquetball coach in Hawaii. He, can you imagine that? You become a world champion. You don't even have a, a coach on your island, right? Wow. In your state. 
yeah, yeah. it's training methods and uh, work ethic. Uh, and then he became the first non non Brazilian to win a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu World Championship. He won blue and purple until they kicked him out because mm -hmm. they were afraid he was going to win brown and black. And then, uh, <laughs> no, that's it's just that's the way it worked. Yeah. Uh, then um, uh, he became an MMA champion. So anyway, the point being that we used to not so much just because uh try to stay out of the sun for that that long you know just yeah. to try to avoid extra sun exposure but we do uh we go to the beach a lot and okay. enjoy that swimming i mean it's just all right try cool. to get as much diversity of training as possible all right well i just got the um 20 battery left uh notification yep. Yep. last week i went past that with um with um um with rick young right oh and yeah it cut off yeah <laughs> oh, no. and it cut off so i don't i don't um i don't want to do that um this week to you right um sean sutton had said he had a question for you but it, it never came up so he'll have to ask you that privately i guess okay we talk all the time right so, okay but hey man thanks again for taking some time out of your day Thank you. And, you know, I want to just mention one other person. I want to mention my guy in Italy, uh, Augusto Baracco. He's in a little okay. town in Italy. He's been up there pushing JKD for – he's been with me uh, 26 years, I think, something like okay. this. Well, send me, send me a message. Send me a message with, uh, with everybody you think I should try to get on the show. And I'll, okay, I'll, wor I'll work on it. He is amazing, this guy. Okay. So, Thank you, Dwight, for what you're doing. Thanks, everybody out there. Uh, thanks for all the people that went to the conference. It was amazing. I want to thank uh, Sigong Taki, Sifu Andy. I want to thank Matt Emery for putting this, that whole thing together. He was awesome. I want to thank Sifu Chris Kent for being amazing. And just, uh, again, as always, Sifu Dan, thank you so much. And thank you, Dwight. All right, man. Take care. Aloha. All righty. All right, cool. So much fun to talk with uh, with Bert Richardson. He's 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 the guy, All right? All right, everybody. That was um, that was uh, episode fifty five of the Jeet Kune Do dialogues. Um, like I said, next Friday. So there are two people I'm working on for next Friday, so I can't confirm. And as you may have heard, in April we're trying to do an all uh, April JKD Femme Fatale. Um, Sean Sutton has confirmed with his student, uh, Yoko. I don't have her last name yet. And, uh, oh, Ka Karen, the T-shirt the is for Wednesday's broadcast, not for the Jeet Kune Do dialogues, because the dialogues is about my dialogue partner, not about me, but I'll do it this, just this, this once. But um, the, the broadcast, when it, this T-shirt is for the broadcast. So during April, uh, Beverly Pratka should be on. Um, maybe, uh, uh, well, definitely. Um, uh, Sarah Badat Richardson and I might get I might get um, Tanya Paulson Bob Burgi maybe you can work on that for me right okay because I tried and, and she was a little bit hesitant maybe Bob with your influence she'll say yes right uh, Michael Brown Guy Chase was on um, before I can send you the link for that um, dialogue if you want to see it, right? Okay, so that's what's going on uh, coming up in the, in the weeks ahead, guys, right? Um, and uh, that's, that's about it, right? Okay, thanks for everybody for showing up and uh, always showing up and chiming in. I will edit this, uh, ask questions and what have you. Sign up for when we go live here on Facebook and when we put the final edit up on the YouTube uh, channels. And uh, go to uh, JKD Rebel, make a purchase. All proceeds go towards upgrading the quality of what we do here on the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues and on the I Love Jeet Kune Do uh, broadcast. All right, that's it for today. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, signing out. You guys take care. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next time.